One word, plastics. That phrase was made iconic by the movie The Graduate in 1967. If you remember that movie, plastics was seen as something of, of progress. It was seen as something durable, something that was good for business, that you could make money off of. And we have seen that permeate society. You can, you can create plastics that really change the world, and, and we have that in, in our everyday lives. I used to work for a big bank, and at this bank I was instrumental in building our oil trading business. So I, I leased our first oil tank, I traded our first physical barrels of oil, I was embedded in, in oil business in a, in a very real way, dealing with customers that were producing oil, producing plastics, uh, using them like airlines uh, that were technology companies, hedge funds, pension funds. And I didn't see a real way for us to transition away from oil in any fast manner. Uh, you had technologies that were starting to develop that could potentially take us away from oil, but they were just far too expensive to actually make a dent in the demand that we have for oil uh, in any material way, in any short time frame. And so when we were looking at oil markets, we were thinking about uh, how the prices would behave. And I'm being asked by, say, hedge funds that electric vehicles even uh, were going to make gasoline prices go to zero. And the reality was that was going to take many decades, and we haven't even seen that happen yet. right? So even though electric vehicles are clearly a phenomenal uh, way to decarbonize, they haven't really moved that, that cost curve to the point where everybody is driving them and you haven't developed products that everyone can use. I can't drive an electric vehicle today because they aren't big enough. They can't fit four car seats. I need four car seats in my electric vehicle and they just don't exist today. We all want to decarbonize if we can, but it needs to be uh, amenable to the way that we have become accustomed to live. I saw some hope because as we were developing our oil business, uh, we started trading plastics and I started looking into what was happening in the plastics markets and big brands were making very meaningful uh, sustainability announcements around plastics. And they were gonna use recycled plastics in their plastics mixes and, and that was not only something that they were saying they were gonna do, but they were standing by it and they were actually doing something about it. And I saw that day to day by having those conversations with the companies where they were exploring how to make these changes and how to include these uh, renewable or well, recycled plastics in this case in, in their bottle mixes. And not only were they making sustainability announcements, but they were increasing them over time. So you would start at say a 10% and then a 20% and go to even 100% of what your expectations were in terms of the future of how much recycled plastics you were going to be using. So. I saw that happening, and then in 2015, you had the Paris Accords that, that led to a, a lot of um, thought around net zero pledges for, for emissions, and in 2019, just a few companies started coming out and making sustainability announcements around their goals for uh, reducing their emissions, and that was in 2019. Uh, fast forward to 2020, 2021, now there are thousands of companies who have made these announcements. And back in 2019, it looked like the market was going to develop in a similar way to the plastics market, that there were going to be companies that were going to increase their goals over time and they were going to stand by them. And I saw these parallels very distinctly. So while I was at the bank, I was investing in some companies. I transitioned my career a little bit to invest in companies that could decarbonize the planet that uh, wasn't by design that I was investing in those. It was for the recycled plastics, but I noticed that they could decarbonize the planet. And then on the carbon offset side, I started seeing that there were technologies that could decarbonize the planet as well, ca capturing carbon from the air and turning it into things that uh, we use every day, like uh, jet fuel, uh, like uh, you could use uh, agricultural byproduct or cellulose to make leather or plastic alternatives. Uh, you could make a polymer that could reflect virtually 100% of the heat away from sunlight and use it in windows. Uh, or, you could do, or you could use CO2 to make concrete even. Uh, or you could do more fun things like uh, turn CO2 into vodka. This is a real product. I was having a conversation today about sourcing some into Houston and I'm hoping we can do that one day soon. Uh, 
you could also make perfume and, and other products that we use every day. And, and these are things that you don't think about as a possibility if you're not looking at it. Um, if you're out in the world and you're just going by your day to day, there isn't much hope that these sorts of products that are made out of CO2, made out of agricultural byproduct that are sustainable, that you're going to be able to use them. But I'd like to emphasize that you should have hope. Uh, there are people that are doing good and making products like these, and you can do well doing it as well these days, which is something that is different than, say, 10 or 15 years ago, when the technology wasn't advanced enough to actually get to that point, and where you didn't have the success of the renewable power sector uh, with the power sector actually being cheap enough now uh, in terms of being able to use sustainable uh, resources like solar and, and wind power to actually make products like these. Many of you may be going through some sort of transition of your own and seeing that there is a possibility that you could do better uh, for the world while also doing well in your careers. Um, and if you haven't gotten there yet, then I think you can get there and, and have hope that, that you can. I'd like to tell uh, a story about a gentleman named Zimri. Zimri, uh, in college, was an economics major. He had a aspiration to be a designer and wanted to design a leather jacket. And he didn't want to design just any leather jacket. He wanted to design a leather jacket that wasn't made from animals and that wasn't made from plastics. So he went around and was looking at all the different materials that he could use to make this leather jacket. And he couldn't find a material suitable that was sustainable to make that leather jacket. So what he did as an economics major in college was start to experiment and researched and then experimented with making some material that could be an alternative for leather that was regenerative, 100% biodegradable. And he did this in his dorm room. And he uh, had the foresight to do it under his roommate's bed because he didn't want all that, that mess under his bed. Uh, but he was successful in making a product that mimicked uh, a leather as, as this college student. So he, he won some awards associated with that, and he decided to make a career out of it. So today, uh, Zimri is, is making a leather alternative out of cellulose, uh, and he is also making some plastic alternatives as well and has aspirations. He's partnering with brands, has aspirations really to grow this. Uh, he actually moved from New York to Houston, being in Houston right now. I appreciate that, uh, that people are migrating to Houston to do good things. And he's repurposing people in Houston that are in the oil industry uh, to use their experience to make these products better and better so that we can have access to it every day. Now I'd like to introduce you to Jason. Jason had uh, aspirations to be in environmental policy. And to transition into environmental policy, he decided that he wanted to start a company because he didn't understand why companies weren't doing uh, better about being sustainable in the way that they were behaving. And he wanted to prove that you could do that and then transition that into policy. So he started a skateboard company. And at the skateboard company, he was using sustainable materials and helping develop new sustainable product because skateboards are made of many different types of things. Uh, he needed many different types of technologies to be developed to be sustainable. So he made these sustainable skateboards for nearly two decades and sold uh, his manufacturing from that business and started advising uh, some professors and other uh, founders toward developing their businesses so that they could scale their businesses. And he found a technology that could turn CO2 into jet fuel. And he saw this as something that was transformational, that if you could turn CO2 into jet fuel, then you could decarbonize the airline industry and you could probably use technologies like that and develop them further to decarbonize other industries. And he was really excited about the prospect of, of changing the world through this new technology. Um, maybe you could even make a skateboard. I'll just uh, throw that out there, out of carbon dioxide, because you can make the materials that go into it today out of, out of carbon dioxide as well. So Jason started transitioning his career in that way. So I invest in companies like Zimri's and like Jason's that can make sustainable product uh, and that can actually decarbonize the planet 
Uh, I started a venture fund focused on carbon reduction and avoidance. So we're investing in, in companies like these and beyond in these hard to decarbonize industries like the, uh, the construction industry, uh, the airline industry, the fashion industry. Uh, these are things that, that I'm passionate about. And I'm passionate about it because I see that there's a path to actually making these things economically and changing the world in a material way where before you couldn't do that and it, was, it felt hopeless. What do these companies need? What do Jason and Zimri need to be successful? They need money. How do you get that money? Normally, a company that you may have thought about might take out some debt from a bank to start their company, or they might go to a public equity market if they're a big corporation and issue some equity. But when you're a young company, you don't have access to those sorts of markets. You can't borrow that debt from a bank, and you can't go to the public markets to, to raise your equity, uh, to raise your capital. So what do you do? You might get a research grant and start at a university and develop that way. You may get a grant from the government. Uh, you may go to friends and family and start uh, developing off of money that you collect uh, in, in the hat. Uh, you may use crowdfunding. In the climate tech space, crowdfunding isn't as common as, as maybe some other areas. Uh, there are angel investors, so folks who are interested in, in supporting startups that will give money that aren't friends and family necessarily, but uh, they act as friends and family, and they'll give you amounts of money to really get your, your idea off the ground. Uh, there's venture capital, like what I do, that uh, comes in at various stages. Uh, we come in quite early, uh, so we, we really like supporting these early founders. Uh, but sometimes it's later stage where maybe the company already has uh, a plant that they've built and they're, they're looking to scale and you'll have venture capitalists come in at that stage. You might have private equity uh, coming in at that stage as well that take a bigger ownership percentage but act in a, in a similar fashion. Uh, strategic investors are, are usually quite important in the climate tech space where you have partners that are uh, the potential uh, maybe the, the users of, of your product in the future or they're designing uh, the plants that you're going to be building. You might have people like this that are coming in to invest, and that's a very important thing uh, because it shows that you have this traction and the support so that you can raise future capital. Eventually, your company might get bought. There might be M&A, uh, mergers and acquisitions, or you might go public and, and be in those public markets in order to get more capital to accelerate your growth. And each of these stages have different risks associated with them. There's a period of time in a company's life where you're outspending uh, what you're bringing in. And so you have to raise more capital and more capital in order to get there. And in the climate tech space, you need a lot of capital in a lot of cases, at least a lot more than you would need in the software business, which is the more traditional uh, business in the venture capital space where people would be investing, the one for the past 20 plus years that people have been investing in. But in the climate, climate tech space, there is also room for venture capital uh, and there's room for many other types of capital, and it all comes in different stages. So you have that, that grant money coming in, you have the venture capital money coming in. Eventually, there's venture debt, there's uh, traditional debt as well. Uh, you can finance in all these different ways, and it goes from the idea all the way through the development and growth, uh, all the way through to the maturity of, of that technology and that maturity of that business. And it's very important for companies to be able to raise that future money to prove in these stages that they can do a little bit and then a little bit more, that they, can, that they have a, a technology that they can actually does something transformative or something interesting that people care about, uh, and then prove that they can make that in a small scale, and then prove that they can make it in a bigger scale, and then eventually they prove that they can make it at the biggest scale and it's, it's transforming the world and you have more and more money coming in. In the climate tech space, you also have something very interesting. You have other ways to fund. There's alternative ways that you can fund your business. There is a very large uh, electric vehicle company that actually is able to sell about $500 million a quarter of carbon credits. And they can do this because they are in a regulated market in a particular geography, in a particular uh, area, because they are transplanting and replacing uh, the carbon-based fuels that we have used in the past. 
And because that marketplace exists, they're able to sell these and finance their business. And this is nearly a billion and a half, $2 billion a year that they are bringing in just from selling these credits. Now, they can do it in this electric vehicle space, but a company that's making an alternative for plastics cannot do that today. There isn't a regulated market for it. And not only is there not a regulated market, the voluntary market where someone might go in order to do that, because there are all these thousands of corporations now that are interested in transitioning their business, and they can't transition the business unless these technologies are successful. Uh, you need the fabric that is like what Zimri wanted that can make a leather jacket. You need that material in order to make the leather jacket. If it doesn't exist and if it, there isn't enough of it, then you can't transition your business. So let's say you are a leather jacket manufacturer and you're buying in uh, animal-based leather and you want to replace that. If you can't get enough to move the needle, if you can only make one jacket out of the material that exists, that's not enough. You need to be able to make thousands. So you, if you could sell a carbon offset associated with that material uh, and even pre-sell it so you have the money today because a lot of the problem is the money is needed now to really advance this scaling it's not needed three years from now. You may not exist three years from now if you can't continue funding your business. But if you can get that money today by, say, selling this carbon offset, it can accelerate the growth of your manufacturing like it did in the electric vehicle business. And then all of a sudden, your cost curve comes down and you're selling a material at the same price, let's say, as what the alternative would be, just like how electric vehicles were really expensive. And now they're the same price as any car that, that someone might want to buy. That is, I guess, to bring it into kind of a millennial parlance, it's like an NFT. You can have this non-fungible token, this, this carbon offset that is uniquely identified in and of itself, and it's scientifically based because you know that material was made out of that particular molecule, and it was less emittive than, say, a different type of material, like an animal-based material or a plastic. You could also have companies pre-purchase, but companies generally don't like to pre-purchase product because they're not getting the product today. They're getting it sometime in the future. And in the case of new technologies, it can be years. So at least in the carbon offset example, you can get something that you can hold on to today associated with something in the future. So you're buying an asset uh, that, that you can then trade if you needed to or sell out if you needed to, but at the same time, you have something that is helping advance the technology. In the case of a pre-purchase, it would be the same, where if someone buys that material early, uh, maybe even a couple years ahead of it being produced, and then they get it later. But most likely, a company would want it when it is produced, and, and that makes it something that they can do. And regulation and legislation kind of uh, aids that. My daughter, a couple weeks ago, uh, said something very interesting. She asked me why I care about these companies. Why do I care if these companies are successful? And I told her that I care because these companies are going to change the world. They, there's a lot of waste in the world, and they can reduce the waste. She countered with, well, well I guess I should say that she tests products with me. So you got these alternative meats, you got these uh, alternative plastics, and she tests the products, which is why she cared to ask the question in the first place. But she said, well, we're all just going to live on the moon one day. Why do we care if these companies are successful? And I said, well, in order to actually live on the moon, we have to have these companies successful because if we live on the moon, we need to make all these different materials and we have to build houses and we have to uh, be able to breathe and we have to be able to have fuel to move around the moon. So we need these companies to be successful in order for us to actually live on the moon. And she kind of just nodded and went back to doing her homework. And... I just I want to emphasize that we need to succeed now if we want the possibility of not living on the moon. And if we want the possibility of living on the moon, we also have to succeed now. We shouldn't have to rely on our children expecting that we're going to be living on the moon one day without realizing that in order to do that, we need to be successful now and change the world that we're in. So thank you very much. I'm proud of her, and um, I'm proud to be here. Thank you very much.